How's everyone doing? This is Ken Allen doing another lecture video for Zoom for neck, back, and head injury. And we're going to go into a little bit about EMT, a little bit about EMR, um, and really talk about what happens when the head and neck and spine are compromised in this case, due to trauma and some kind of uh, mechanism of injury that damages it. We've already spoken about head trauma or head injury, rather, uh, in the case of strokes and TIAs and ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, as well as the ones that fix themselves through the body's uh, thrombolytic abilities to create a, a TIA where the stroke comes and resolves itself in under 24 hours. But today, we're gonna talk mainly about how these uh, occur when a patient is uh, involved in some kind of traumatic emergency. Now, what we're going to do to treat this is your bread and butter for every single head, neck. And in fact, most trauma patients will always get a C collar, a cervical collar placed on a backboard. If you can, supine is the best way to do it anatomically spider straps and ending with a head bed. We always end in that order. It typically goes C collar onto the backboard, strapped in as the patient assessment is being done or just afterwards, followed lastly by the head bed to secure the backboard onto the backboard. You don't want to have that head secured and the rest of the body not so that the body can do this. You want everything, the big portion of the body first and then the, the top of the head uh, at the very end. This is what we do for every one of those uh, trauma calls and we bring every patient in like that. And a treatment for this is aside from early recognition, it's the, the basic EMT uh, holy trinity. It's the control A, B and C, position that is uh, packaging that won't do any further damage and if possible position of comfort and rapid transport to the appropriate trauma facility. So that is what we are gonna be working on. We're going to talk about a large amount of other, a wide array of other head and neck and back problems tonight, but our treatment is more or less the same. We're just, we're controlling C-spine. We're managing a patient, putting them in a comfortable position to get them to the hospital without any further damage rapidly transporting while maintaining stable airway breathing and circulation. So without any further ado, let's get started. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this thing right here, a big head and inside there, and you notice that there's you know soft tissue and everything that covers all of this, but inside is this really strong scaffold of bone. And then inside there is the, the, the very, uh, sensitive, juicy nut of the brain and its little spinal cord that runs through the body there. And that can be damaged pretty sufficiently through not that uh, traumatic in injury. In fact, simple falls, depending on the patients, may be enough to do some serious damage. So simple trip and falls from standing position may be the culprit in more than one of these situations. We're going to look at the, the head facial neck and spine trauma, talk about recognition, what signs and symptoms should we be looking for? And of course, the management that we are going to provide, which is usually just C-spining, rapid transport and high flow oxygen if need be. So we'll get into <clears throat> our basic anatomy and physiology first, followed by a variety of traumatic injuries that will affect that anatomy and physiology. All right, so we're looking at the nervous system, which is, of course, the most complex system we're going to delve into tonight, if you will, because it's, it is the way that the body sends signals back and forth for, to, to all of the organs and all of the tissues, and it's how we are analyzing information coming from those organs and tissues, and it's how we send out reactionary data to do things with those organs and tissues, and that's a really fancy way of saying your hand feels something strong in the hand. It sends a signal to your brain that says you could throw this really far and you grab it and you huck it as far as you can. It's a very, you know, it, we take this all for granted, but it is incredibly complex in how it works. And that's only to speak of the things that are voluntarily controlled. We will get into the involuntary systems as well. 
And without our even thinking, our body is maintaining our life support systems, which is just nothing short of miraculous. So we'll talk about the brain, branching from the brain down the spinal cord, the nerves that then jut or uh, innervate out of the spinal cord that reach out to the rest of the body tissues. And understand that there are two different kinds of nervous systems. The way we break it down in EMS is the central and the peripheral nervous system. And all of these nerves are, for the most part, protected by the, the length of the nerves are protected by a large amount of tissue, of bone, of fascia, and muscle. And all of these nerves run through all of that and skin, of course. So we're looking at two different types of the of nervous system here. The central nervous system, which is consisting of the brain and the spinal cord or the spinal column. That is your essential central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system now is everything from branching from that spinal cord that then extends all through and innervates and insinuates all of the tissues of the body, wrapping around the shoulders, on the back, around the chest, to the abdomen, out the arms, along the muscles of the arms, to the skin, to the hands, fingers, toes, feet, all of those motor and sensory neurons, the motor neurons that allow movement, the sensory neurons that allow us to take in the external environment are what we consider the peripheral nervous system. We're looking at the brain or the control center of the body. This is the center of consciousness uh, in more ways than one. It is our consciousness that we can control in that small telescope of, of, of conscious attention but also what allows all of the other functions of the body to go on without us having to think about it, which again is quite a feat. So working from the most uh, rationalizing and complex, I should say, although it really is arguable what is more complex, the part of our brain that can intellectualize or the part of it that doesn't need to even be conscious of itself working. But in any case, the part that we consider the most human is this big old crenulated massive growth on the top of the brain, the cerebrum. This giant area here is what's in charge of behavior, understanding group mentality, understanding speech, learning um, movement, motor movement, utilizing left and right sides of the body, being artistic, so forth all stems from the cerebrum. We then start going down deeper towards the core of the body or the core of the brain, and you begin to become more and more of the life support, the most essential or primitive parts of the body. The cerebellum is just below and posterior to the cerebrum, and the cerebellum is largely about coordination about learning reaction, quick reactions, about navigating things like stairs and equipment and so forth. And lastly, the brain stem or the midbrain where the medulla is located, that is your involuntary life support systems. So as I mentioned, the cerebrum is like all of your STEM mind, you know, thinking science, technology, uh, mathematics, understanding of the world we're in this is what we rely on when we're conscious to to understand and navigate the world so you know this is where your math and your science and everything is the cerebellum as i mentioned would be like walking downstairs and things but what they're also seeing with this coordinated effort is that you will uh, retain a lot of muscle memory in the cerebellum regarding, let's say you have an artistic mind, you're right-minded, right-brain thinker, and you have a knack for some artistic thing, music or, or painting. Well, that is the impetus for you to go and start to play with brushes and, and musical equipment, or uh, let's say, you know, sporting equipment and so forth. But all of the memory from the moment you pick up that baseball and begin to throw it, or you begin to strum that guitar, all of that information is being stored inside the cerebellum. So actually the cerebellum is a huge um, memory store for 
for muscle memory, you know, playing the guitar, learning the right chords to place, good throw with, you know, your fingers on the on the seam, throwing up and down, throwing a curveball. That stuff is stored more or less in the cerebellum than the cerebrum. And then as you go down into the most essential functions of the body, your breathing, your heart rate, your blood pressure, all controlled by the midbrain, the brain stem. That brainstem is in a pretty precarious spot because right below the brainstem is the foramen magnum. It's the only opening of the brain down the spine. And sometimes that midbrain can press on the foramen magnum and be squeezed through that hole, which we call herniation. And anytime you're smashing brain parts against bone, expect the area that that brain part controls to be malfunctioning, if that makes sense. So if I'm poking on this part of the brain, well, whatever those nerves do, they're going to be malfunctioning on the side of the body that they control, if that makes any sense. And so when we have head trauma that affects the midbrain, expect to see difficulties and issues with breathing, blood pressure, and pulse. Now, working our way up from the midbrain, the brainstem, we have this, what they call the reptile brain or the amygdala. And in this area, this is what controls um, your basic reptilian survival emotions. This is where things like anger, fury, frustration, um, love, lust, libido uh, largely comes from this area here. And it is kind of this, like these two little lobes in here where these emotions stem from. And usually what they're seeing, they thought for a long time that your brain's rationale would work by stimulating the cerebrum and then indicating or sending that signal down to the core of the amygdala, giving you those sensations. What they're seeing more and more often is that signals begin at the smallest stem of the brain, radiate to the amygdala, you get emotions and those emotions are then filtered through your rationale. What that means is we are more often than not rationalizing for the sake of what we want emotionally than stifling the feelings of, of greed and lust and love and stuff. So really we use the cerebrum to justify um, our emotional states, which is a very interesting thing to consider. Okay, as we stem down from the spinal cord, excuse me, from the brain, we go down the length of the spine. The spinal cord is this dense knot of fibers of nerves. I mean, and we're talking billions of fibers of nerves. It's an unbelievably complex system of neurons and neurons are nerve cells that some of them are very, very microscopically small. Some of them stretch for feet long. It's incredibly dense, it's highly packed. And at this point in our technology, once a neuron is completely severed, we are not capable of repairing that injury. And that's gonna come into play later on when we're talking about spinal injuries. Um, these signals that we're talking about are the signals leaving the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and going out to the outside environment, to the muscles that allow for motor movement, to the skin cells that take in the sensation of things, temperature, pressure, um, hard, soft. And that information is being gathered from the external world through sensory neurons, sent up to the spinal cord, and from the spinal cord to the brain, processed, and then information is sent down or reaction is sent down to the rest of the body to act upon whatever has been sensed. And who knows what really comes first? Was it the sensation that causes the reaction or the reaction that causes the sensations out in the world or the way you move around? It's a bit of a chicken and the egg. I guess it would be the sensation that causes the reaction. But that's, um, that's, another, that's a story for some other time. So when we'd say that there is this gray and white matter, that is what we're referring to. It's the neurons. It's the the different nerve cells in some places it's densely packed and they have a kind of dark gray color in other areas it's much more of a fatty tissue and it is a whiter color and in this spot here this would be a cross section 
of your spinal cord here, these little branching nerves coming off the central column of the spinal cord are these nerves branching out from the vertebrae. This is probably like a one millimeter cross section sliced in about a millimeter. This is an artist's simplistic drawing of this. Now there's an image here that's gonna blow your mind if, if you're at all like me. It's an electron microscopic image of the, not only this same cross section, only a micron thick, but also the electrical capability of this thing to fire signals backwards and forwards through it. <clears throat> Sorry about that, hang on one second. Here we go. Now look at that. I, I don't know how you can't have your mind blown by looking at that. And it has this butterfly shape to it. Do you see that? What that is, is basically a, um, hang on a second. That is a signal of the, um, of all those different cakings of white and gray matter. And some of them are motor nerves. Some of them go branching to the front. Some of them are dorsal nerves that branch to the back of the body. But in each case, it's a conglomeration of some sensory and some motor. And so, and you can see here, if these are a little electrical signals, which is what the computer is trying to image for us, for us simple-minded humans, you're just seeing billions of electrical signals firing off at any given second of existence. It is just a kaleidoscope of, of cities and lights and activity. And it's just one micron thick. So you imagine those signals are constantly up and down and out and back. Um, and then keep in mind here, if you, you don't always completely sever the spinal cord, transecting it entirely across. Oftentimes spinal cords get torn on one edge or the one front or the back. And if that's the case, well, you're not gonna lose complete feeling all the way down, but maybe you lose the use of some of the muscles, you lose the, the sensation on some of the nerves and potentially you can still, albeit you're a paraplegic, maybe you have the ability to use some of your arms and hands but maybe you've lost the ability to do fine motor or something of that sort. So uh, even when you hear people are paraplegics or quadriplegics, sometimes fortunately enough, they're not complete paraplegics or quadriplegics. And that's because this little butterfly shape here was only partially torn, partially severed, but there's still intact signals. You'll also see as we move forward that there are these, these branches that branch from the shoulders and at the hips that interweave nerves and will allow the signals to kind of go around about around damaged spots and still innervate the different tissues of the body. Here's a really strong, these are some great slides that I found for this. Um, and you can see here, if you look at the spine, the bony protrusions that hang off these spinous processes, they are kind of like shingles on a roof that protect or they're like uh, armor uh, mesh on an, on a, on an armored uh, um, suit where they overfold over each other and don't allow you know things to get into there. They're kind of like little plates, but they're open in the back so they can still allow the nerves to branch out from underneath them. And if you look at those spines, in between each vertebrae, of course, are these little discs, these little cartilaginous discs. The cartilage discs allow for axial shock absorption for like you running and walking. They, they pound against one another and the discs take up some of that shock absorption. It allows also if bone sticks to bone for longer than about two or three hours, there are these little microscopic calcium bridges that begin to grow between the bones and eventually those bones fuse together. So in some cases, um, you have to continually break those fuses up by moving around and stretching and operating your back correctly. Um, but in some situations, if you herniate or you blow those discs out of place, the spots where the bone is still touching, and let's say the disc is sitting between, you can see my two hands, the disc is in here and it 
it squirts out one edge and this portion of the bone is touching and the disc is kind of stuck out here. These two bones within a few hours will start to fuse together. And what you have to do is stretch, stretch your back out and pop them apart. It's, it's excruciating in some cases. And so that can be a concern. Oftentimes you'll hear about people getting their backs fused. What that means is they go in, surgically remove the damaged um, disc between them and then kind of just stick them together and put in some locking pieces, little braces, and the bones do the rest for them. The bones will actually grow together on their own without much work. Of course, when that happens, those two discs or two vertebrae that used to be able to move independently have now locked together. Perhaps you don't have as much pain, but you've also lost mobility. So in a lot of these situations, you'll notice that with the ability of movement, you also increase your risk of damaging to that spot. Case in point, the neck and the low back, the areas where your neck where your body can move the most, articulate the most, or manipulate the most, also are the highest risk for trauma. Because when you hit, well, those things swing around the most. They're the least reinforced. All right, so I'll take a look at the skull. Uh, when we get into head trauma, we'll be looking at the basilar skull here. You can see here's our basilar skull. Move over to the lower left. Here is that basilar skull. This is the olfactory nerve running underneath just about the eye level, running into the sinuses of the nose. Um, and you have this kind of very, very crisp tissue thin bone that runs underneath basically by the ear and out to the back of the occiput. This is your uh, this is the foramen magnum. So this is the back of the body where the spinal cord will travel down through that bony protrude, that bony hole. But look over here. Here is where your eyes would sit. They're resting just inside and just below that little opaque. It's so skinny. It's so thin. It's opaque. The eyes are just underneath there. Here is this part right here is the olfactory holes right there. So you can see it's just this very thin, thin line of bone. And in these holes is where your sinuses would run through. Over here are where your ears, the eardrums, the eustachian tubes would run through. That's right here on the side picture. And you can see the brain just kind of sits in this tissue thin, opaque bone. And if you have a significant facial trauma or occipital trauma, it could theoretically happen on both sides also, you can very easily shatter the base of the skull. And we have what's called basilar skull fracture. What's nice to see here is you can see how easy it is to break one, but then also why when you have basilar skull trauma and you sever some of the blood vessels running through here or the, the sac that holds the cerebral spinal fluid, how and why it leaks into the ears or leaks into the nose. You fracture that and that's the natural holes that that blood and cerebral spinal fluid is gonna flow. So it's very easy to see from this image where the basilar skull is as well as why it leaks its fluid into the ears or behind the ears or through the nose or under the eyes, because that's exactly where that basilar skull sits. Okay, so now what we should look at is, even though the brain is held in the bone, there's also all of this fascia that covers all of your body's tissues, and it's no different than the brain and the spinal cord. And in the brain and spinal cord, the particular fascia that covers that, like the pleura is the fascia that covers the lungs, the dura is the covering around the brain and spinal cord. It's also called the meninges. The meninges are different layers of dura that run from the just inside the skull that cover the brain, go between the brain and the blood vessels, the blood vessels and the inner layer of fascia and the fascia and the gray matter. And that's called the dura. And I'm sure you've heard that because of the term epidurals. Remember this stuff goes all the way down the spine. And if you're gonna give some kind of local anesthetic to 
stop the pain of chronic back injuries or childbirth. They go in between the spinal vertebrae and they will inject an anesthetic just into that dura or just outside the arachnoid dura, causing an epidural, you know, just outside that dural and, and a puncture to give flu, give anesthetic to numb all of those nerves that are running through there. So here you can see from the periosteum of the skull, you have the two rigid spots. There's your spongy skull. Above this would be skin and tissue like fascia that holds the skin in place and hair, of course, if you have it. The next step down, there's a little bit of cerebral spinal fluid that runs inside there. After that, you have this durable, very tough, leathery dura called the dura mater, which means tough mother. So the tough mother, this durable mother is kind of leathery. It's almost a brown gray color. It really is a strong supportive covering that covers the brain, runs down the length of the spinal cord, and it keeps that thing housed. It keeps it more or less separated from any of the skeletal structures that surround it. Incredibly fine insulation that runs all the way through. Uh, as you move through that dura mater, and this is like, this stuff all has to be peeled back if they do brain surgeries. And um, if they're gonna operate on anybody, you have to make your way through all of these different fascial or dural layers. Moving through the dura mater, we get into this web-like, like these little fibrous layers that run between the, the underside of the dura and the inner side of the pia mater. These are like these, like, it's kind of like, um, almost like, like moss-like or sheet-like or fibrous or web-like, I guess you could say, um, fascia that kind of float and kind of keep everything suspended and also are floating inside cerebral spinal fluid. We call it the arachnoid layer or the arachnoid mater because it looks like spider webs, arachnoid. So it looks very web-like and kind of ethereal or gossamer, I guess is the term. You know what I mean? It's kind of this very, you know, thin and interlacing fascial layer. In that layer, you can see here, are the arteries and veins that start to feed the brain itself. Usually in this area, there's a, some pretty large arteries. This is why when we're dealing with epidural bleeds to the skull, the arteries are very, they bleed very fast. And then when they rupture, you notice those signs and symptoms within minutes to hours, depending on the extent of the bleed. Okay, moving down further into the nerve center of the brain, you have the arachnoid layer, these, these little blood vessels running through. And then lastly, the pia mater or the soft mater, soft mother, gentle mother. The term piano, I don't know if you know, the real term is piano forte, which means this is, this is, by the way, I'm going to do this the whole time so that I stay sane as I continue to uh, lecture to myself in this room. So the piano forte Usually, the cool thing about the piano when it first came out was you could play it hard, like a harpsichord. You notice the harpsichord's got the same volume all the way through. But the piano, because you can, you can adjust your strength of touching the keys, you can also adjust the way that the strings are plucked. And thus, you can play it strong, forte. Da -da -da -da. Or you can play it piano. You can play it softly. Ding, ding, ding. Twinkle on the keys. And that's what this is kind of indicating. This P is like the soft, gentle covering that is the last layer of fascia that surrounds and coats the nerves, the blunt, you know, actual very sensitive nerves in the gray and the white matter of the brain. And of course, floating inside the, these um, what these things are floating inside of is cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. And it's mostly water. It's mostly, it's, it's, it's similar to, to plasma that you, your cells have inside them, um, you know, similar to blood, but it is separated out. So when you get to the cerebral spinal fluid, there is a blood brain barrier 
Some drugs can get across that, some drugs cannot. The cerebral spinal fluid is about 125 to 150 milliliters of fluid that's very, um, you know, water-like, but there's proteins and other chemicals in there. Electrolytes, carbon, carbon dioxide, oxygen is diffused in that, and that's feeding the brain, and that's also being analyzed by the receptors and everything. And that fluid is just this aqueous solution that allows the organs that are very fragile to float and have some shock absorption so that when I'm walking or I'm running, the brain isn't smashing into the inside of my basilar skull. It's got some fluid that's kind of squish, squash, squish, and it's, you know, moving around and keeping everything more or less insulated. And, you know, it kind of stabilizes those tissues as you move around. Here it's where it's created in what they call the third ventricle, which is this, you know, this, there's a little gap inside the inner portion of your brain where the fluid floats and coats and is analyzed and is created. And as it goes in, it comes, look at this, it goes, it comes up and around and floats across the brain frontally, three-dimensionally it's kind of flowing around and, and keeping everything in, in motion and, and, and flotation. Back. Okay. Now that, as I mentioned, the dura runs all the way down the spine. So we would be, you know, still seeing dura all the way down to this area. This is the, as I mentioned, the central nervous system and branching from that are all these peripheral spinal nerves, all these peripheral motor and sensory nerves branching off the spinal cord that then make their way around the back, around the chest and the armpits. You can tickle them, they get you, hee -hee, you know, that stuff. That's all of those sensory nerves, feeling it on your chest, your abdomen, um, that innervate into the peritoneum, into the thoracic cavity. These nerves are branching as they leave the spinal cord and they kind of keep this daisy chained effect where they're branching, going out, branching, going down a little bit further, branching out. And um, the issue with this is if you sever this spinal cord somewhere, depending on where you sever it, all these spinal and motor nerves will be affected. Either it's a partial tear and a portion of them are separated out and we can't fix them, or it's a complete tear. It's a laceration and every spot below the, the, the fracture or the laceration line loses intonation, loses the nervous tone. It loses the ability to sense and the ability to move. And when that happens, we consider that a paralysis or that's a paralyzed quadriplegic or a paraplegic. Quadriplegic means one, two, three, four limbs no longer work. Paraplegic is the lower limbs do not work. So it goes, it stands, I would think that if you have a back spinal cord injury, you would want it as low as possible so that you don't lose everything from the top down. You want it as close to the tailbone as possible. Um, what's cool in this case, as I mentioned, are these plexus, the plexuses, the plexi. There's the brachial plexus and there's the lumbosacral plexus. This is also called the cauda equina, the, the horse's tail or the tail of the horse, the cauda equina. And with these, you can see that they, they, um, they inter they they interweave with one another and what that means is if you have a tearing of this nerve you will still have the ability of other ancillary nerves or other peripheral nerves to get around that damaged portion of tissue and still reach the distal extremities so you could have a tear or a herniation or a severing of one of these spinal nerves, but because this plexus integrates all those different nerves together, there are side paths for the signals to get around the damaged area and to still make it out to your fingers and toes. So um, it's not always a complete paralysis of one arm or both arms or both legs and arms. So 
that you have this plexus to thank for that. The other thing you need to keep in mind are they have, there are these nerves that run directly from one part of the brain, specifically down in a separate spot of the spinal cord to the parts specifically that they control. And these are called the cranial nerves. And so I'll explain it a little bit better. If you were ever an electrician, uh, this is what we would call you run home runs, where you run a specific wire directly from the power box, from the circuit breaker, directly to the washing machine. You would run a separate one directly to the dryer. You'd run a third one to the oven, to the dishwasher, and then another one to the, the microwave. And the thinking with that is those nerve branches or those home runs are only specific for one device on the other end. Another way uh, kind of a cheap electrician would do it, would they would run one big line to the kitchen. And then from there, they would branch it to the oven, to the dishwasher, to the microwave. The problem with that is if that one line is lopped off or it blows, you lose all of those different um, conveniences. So you want a dedicated nerve bundle to run from that specific part of the brain to the organ or organs that it is in charge of. Most of those cranial nerves run to the face. There's the olfactory nerve that's in charge of smell and taste. There's the optic nerve that's in charge of sight, of actually understanding sight, of actually taking sight and running it through the system to understand what we're looking at. They're the trochlear nerves that control the muscles that hold the eyes. So where the optic nerves are gaining information, it's controlled largely by the trochlear nerves. The ocular motor nerves also control that. So you have all these different nerves that run specifically to places on the eyes, in the, on the very sensitive organs, the nose, the eyes, the mouth, the tongue, the facial expressions are controlled by specific nerves like the trigeminal nerve, like... There's a nerve dedicated to seeing, do patients smile, do patients frown. That's how important it is in our, in our brains, in our lexicon, in our behavioral understanding of other humans. Like we have specific nerves to do all that. This becomes a much more important thing to deal with when you become a paramedic and certainly a doctor and nurse. The one that we should keep in mind at this point is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is ironically a vagus and an Elvis and all this other stuff. So funny. So the vagus nerve is a parasympathetic nerve. When it is stimulated, it causes your parasympathetic tone to also become excited. Parasympathetic information is the feed breed or the rest digest portion of the body. That means that the parasympathetic tone, when it's stimulated, causes the blood to go to the digestive organs. It helps digest food. When parasympathetic tone reaches the heart, it slows the heart down. It drops the blood pressure. It slows down your breathing. The vagus nerve is used in some cases to try and slow our patient's heart rates up down if they're in an unstable speed. Um, we can do that by causing bearing down for the patient telling that bear down like you're having a bowel movement by doing that you stimulate the vagus nerve and everything begins to slow down and we'll get into different ways and why we would do that another way of doing it would be just rubbing on the carotids although they say that's a little too dangerous to be doing in any case what's nice about that vagus nerve that runs into the digestive organs and still allows for your heart to beat and your blood pressure to stay stable and your your food to be digested is if you are a paraplegic or a quadriplegic, rather than having all of those systems shut down because you have a specific cranial nerve that runs to that spot, that means that you can still digest food. You can still live a semi-normal life even though you don't have the use of your muscles and legs and feet, you still can at least eat food, have bowel movements. You can even ovulate in most cases and bring children to term. And yes, they'll do a C-section, but you can still 
you know, participate in the basal human functions, the involuntary functions of digestion, heartbeats, pulse, ovulation, so forth. Show that later time, but okay. So how does this work? So basically you have all of these reflexes going on. You have voluntary and involuntary activities. And we only concern ourselves with voluntary activities. This is what we do while we are conscious, while we're waking. This is us moving around, grabbing stuff, playing with things, um, speaking, using our words, using our language, using our mouths, our tongues, our lips, being able to operate in this world how we see fit. That's what we would consider all voluntary activities. And if you're looking at this neuron here, this is an average neuron cell. Here would be what they call the dendrites. These are the receptor nerves, and they are attached to these, the axons. This is the sending the signal away from the nerve. So the signal comes in here. And then that neuron sends it on its way through the axon. So all along attached to these, these dendrites would be other axons from other nerves. And this is essentially how signals are sent through your body. You send a signal from a dendrite, or sorry, you send it through an axon that gets picked up from a dendrite on a neuron and it sends that signal whoosh right through itself down an axon and out the rest of the body. This is a very simplistic drawing. Here's another one of those um, electronic imaging computer systems that has done what it would go and what the speed of this actually looks like. That's about the speed at which a neuron sends a signal along. Boom. Basically the speed of light or close to it. You know, in, in this case, it's, it's, it's faster than the speed of sound. Um, and that's the signal traveling through that portion of the of the neuron and that signal traveling on from that neuron to the rest of the body on its way out okay in addition to that we have these motor nerves that are bringing uh, signals down to the arms and legs to move and manipulate the world we have the sensory nerves that come up and touch and feel things and those sensory nerves send signals to the brain for processing for the motor nerves to act on those in some cases, it may be a little too long for that to occur because whatever is being sensed is too dangerous to keep your hand on for any longer than a few milliseconds. You want to stop whatever that dangerous or damaging activity is. So in some cases, we have reflex feedback loops or reflex arcs where the signal, if you put your hand, say, over a hot flame, the signal only has to travel down the sensory nerves as far as the attachment on the spinal cord, rather than having to then travel up to the brain for processing and decision-making. The signal goes right to that spot. It intermeshes with a motor nerve that just by reflex is no, no, hand off, take it off. So the sensory signal sends it only as far as the spinal cord, and the nerve motor nerve attached to it sends a reflex signal right back, get your hand off there. And you can kind of sense this because when this happens, let's say you put your foot into really hot bath water or something, you don't initially feel the pain. You feel almost like this cold or this overwhelming feeling begin to build in about a half second. And you quickly take your foot off or you take your hand off the burner. And then almost about a second after you've removed your body part from the painful stimulus, then you feel the pain. So you pull it off and then you feel it. And that's because you had the reflex to remove it before that signal portion of that signal got to the brain to be processed and for that to actually make sense that it was indeed painful. And that's when you feel it. It's pretty astounding. So our body has those little reflex loops to just speed up the process of removing the, the body part from a dangerous environment. Uh, your skull is made up of kind of some strong, long bones like the frontal, occipital, temporal, and parietal bones. Those are all what we would call the cranium. 
And then you have all of these irregular bones of the face. So the, the nasal bone, the, the, the orbitals, the zygoma, the, the cheekbones, the maxilla, the mouth, the mandible, the jaw. Um, these are all these irregular bones that are, again, very, very fragile, very unique looking. And if they are damaged, they cause a lot of issues for the human, um, just for normal processing and vision and sight. But also, you know, speaking and facial expressions are all controlled by that. As you move down from the skull, we have the spinal cord. There are seven cervical top numbers. Basically, number one, C1, is what we call Atlas. Atlas was the Greek god that held up the earth. So, too, does C1 hold up the skull. So, the, a, a cute name for it is Atlas. The next one down has this little finger that protrudes up through it, that Atlas swivels on that number two is called axis so it goes atlas axis and then c3 4 5 6 and c7 if you were to reach back and feel the back of your neck c7 is that landmark that you feel that's a little bit uncomfortable to press on moving down from c7 because you have 12 thoracic ribs you're going to have 12 thoracic vertebrae so it's just broken up because the next 12 have ribs attached or a stem around from those. That branch is called the thoracic, followed by the lumbar, lower five. Some people have additional lumbar vertebrae. What I've been told, because I have additional ones, is not only am I a mutant, that it's not an additional one that has grown. What it most likely is, is an unattached sacral vertebrae that instead of being fused to the pelvis instead of being fused to the sacrum uh, and to the ilium the the side pieces here uh, it's free floating so it moves around it gives a little added mobility pretense perhaps but also as i mentioned before with added mobility to the lower and higher back the neck and the lumbar comes the higher risk of damage because with a regular you know, traumatic injury, if it's not secured, if it's not reinforced, then it's able to move around and become overexerted, overextended. And with that overextension is quite usually quite normally um, um, injury that goes along with it. Okay. So, but typically 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, four coccygeal or four tailbone pieces. The sacrum, all of the vertebrae in a normal human are, all five are fused together down the back, attached to the hips, to the backside of the hips. And the coccyx is what we would call a vestigial organ. It's a, it's a leftover bit of bone from animals, our ancestors that had tails, I guess, is the, is the, most modern thinking on the subject. So let's get into traumatic injuries or insults to the head. And we're going to need to look into exactly what it's, you know, causing in this situation. What is an issue is that you will get into what we call distracting injuries, injuries that look really bad. Um, they're grotesque and they throw your, your brain off. But those may not be the most life-threatening emergencies. What you're concerned with is if you have an ugly, distracting, bloody, messy injury, what did that injury do to the interior organs? What did it do to the very sensitive brain? So working our way from the outside in, from the most superficial into the most life-threatening, we have the soft tissue of the skin, the muscle, the fat, and the hair. We have the bone below that. There's fascia separating all of these out. You have the blood vessels that run between the bones and the dura. And then lastly, you have the brain matter in between there. And head injuries, because of how sensitive everything is in there, they account for over half of all traumatic deaths. Any injury that goes along with that, you know, oftentimes it's not just head trauma, it's head and body trauma. But the addition of head trauma really goes um, goes against any kind of survival. You've 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 blown the circuits of the mainframe. Uh, 
And those circuits are going to have a, a lot of issues trying to get back in, into operational order. So let's get into when we talk about head injuries, we talk about closed injuries where the brain is closed. Uh, the injury has not broken out to the outside environment. That's usually with like blunt trauma, you know, baseball bats, windshields, ground, something that's not penetrating. Whereas an open injury is typically from an, a penetrating trauma. This could be knives, um, rebar, bullets, you name it, you know, swords, that stuff is going to cause that kind of not just damage and potentially some blunt trauma too. If it's a dull blade or, you know, it could be a hard baseball bat that tears through the skin. The problem is not only do you do blunt trauma damage, but you've also introduced the outside environment. And with that infection and, you know, and the, the added in, um, increase in the mechanism, how hard it was hit to that bone area that now infection becomes a big concern. Also, parts of the brain could come out while this happens. So you may see bleeding and ex exposed brain tissue. Here is some basic scalp lacerations. This woman has a hematoma on her head. And you can see here that there's just bleeding into the underside of the scalp. That's a pretty good, what we would call like a knot. Like that's a pretty good little smack on the head, probably hit the windshield or something bounced off her head. She's obviously conscious. I'd be looking at pupils. Do they seem pearl? Yep, she seems okay. Um, she's laughing about it, but it's not something to take lightly. This is what we would call a distracting injury and, and even the next picture would more so. We have to consider what is going on in the brain underneath. And oftentimes with head trauma, patients seem completely with it for the first two or three hours after the accident. And then suddenly they decompensate, become unconscious, they become comatose, they have seizures and they bleed out. And it's because all the while they're conscious and speaking to you, you lower your guard. You say, yeah, go ahead. You can go home. Meanwhile, they're bleeding into their brain. And at some point it becomes too much and they gork out. They, their brain either herniates out through that hole or it just swells up into the point and it shuts down all of the motor abilities of the nerves that it, the ner that the blood is pressing against in the brain or whatever ends up happening ends up killing them later in life. So or later in the day or later the next day. So those small lacerations could theoretically bleed out if let's say that you're a pediatric kid uh, or you're an elderly patient on blood thinners, but usually these small cuts and bruises, they're, you, know, you package them, you pack them up, you put some bandages on them, maybe a pack an ice or something on it and you get them to the hospital, but they need to look at the CT scan once they get to the hospital. Likewise with something like, a deeper injury, even like this, this is a much more um, terrifying image to see. Wow, that looks bad, right? This is what we would call an avulsion, where a flap of skin is kind of pulled away from the skull. This is what's going on when, um, when Native Americans would scalp people. They would grab their hair, and then they would just grab something sharp, like a knife or a tomahawk or whatever you got, whatever you're carrying is your average Native American on Warpath and slice across the scalp, grab with the hair and yank it off. So you would tear a large patch of hair off of a patient, off of, off of a person that doesn't kill them though. If remember what kills our patients immediately is any significant issues compromised to airway or breathing or bleeding or circulation. So anytime we have a hemorrhaging, um, an arterial bleed, that could kill our patient. But right here, if you're looking at this, I don't see a lot of bleeding actively occurring at this point. Yes, it bled a significant amount at some point, but right now, either they have um, cauterized the wounds or it stopped bleeding on its own. What we should be concerned with, though, is what did this what was this and what did it do inside the skull? What do we have to be concerned with inside on the brain? Okay. 
We're going to take a look at some injuries to the, to the head. We're looking for deformities to the skull, visible cracks to the skull, bruising that develops under the eyes, which we call raccoon eyes. This is an image of a patient with raccoon eyes, just because it looks like, you know, the, the raccoons bandit eyes. This is probably a few days after the trauma because there's significant swelling to this spot. That takes a while for that to occur. You will get dark black eyes um, within, you know, maybe an hour or so from the injury. But the amount of edema that's filling into that spot is, you know, the amount of other fluids that are puffing up the face. That's probably a day or so old. Down below that, you see what's called battle sign, which is from William Henry Battle, who was a surgeon in the, I believe, 1800s. So like many doctors and surgeons, you would cut your teeth on, um, on war campaigns where you would be shipped out with soldiers to patch up whatever happened to them while, on, um, while in, in conflict. So William Henry Battle was on a ship for a while. I think he was also, I think he was on the ground as well, but in any case, he noticed with significant head trauma, basilar skull fracture, remember that paper thin tissue like opaque bone, when it fractures, it can leak blood and CSF behind the ear, out the ear, out the nose, under the eyes, that cerebral spinal fluid and blood um, is a very definite indication that you fractured some blood vessels and probably the dura of the of the of the of covering the brain so that fluid is leaking out it's getting out through the holes in the basilar skull leaking blood and cerebral spinal fluid out the nose the ears underneath the eyes the way you can test for that by the way is you get a piece of gauze and you place the gauze up against the ear Look at the gauze. If there's a red dot followed by a wet mark around it, like a target, usually that indicates that's blood and cerebral spinal fluid. The blood is a different viscosity. It's thicker. So the blood stays in a closer circle. The cerebral spinal fluid, more like water, meanwhile, kind of dilutes and spreads out. So you get this red dot in the center and a watery circle around it. That's what we call a target. And that indicates blood and cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so looking at fractures, of course, how can the skull break? Well, we have ways of measuring it. We'll say that a linear is a simple fracture of the skull, if there's such a thing as a simple skull fracture. About 80% of all skull fractures are that, and we're not gonna really be able to tell you need to get them into an MRI or an X-ray so that you can see what is going on. For us, if we feel a soft patch, if we feel a bulging patch, if we notice a level of consciousness change, if we see blood and CSF or discoloration out the ears, behind the ears, in the mouth, what I just mentioned, all of that, possibly nausea, projectile vomiting, those are all indications of increased pressure in the head. Let's imagine if we see that, that we have skull fracture and let's treat it as a worst case scenario and we'll work our way back. More, uh, more bad would be depressed skull fracture where a piece breaks in the entirety of the skull. And so there's a, just kind of an opening or a concavity to that space. That also now has introduced some bone chips that could get in and cut through the dura or even into the brain itself. This we may feel a soft area and you press on it and it just kind of goes in, but not always because again, if there's bleeding going on, it's going to bulge out as well. So you're pressing and you can see it go down and then sometimes fill back up. It's a lot softer than touching your scalp. Um, I, have, I have been on several calls where by pressing on the head, the bleeding from the ears goes, what comes out the ears. And I mean, you can clearly say that I, I would imagine that is a significant bleed and a significant skull fracture. Okay, so usually these skull fractures occur on the frontal bone. That would be, of course, the front, the forehead, 
The temporal are the temporal parts just above the ears, between the, you know, where we would say here are my temples. The parietals, the next bone up, that touches on the top here, that's your parietal bones, temporal bones, parietal bones, frontal bones, occipital bones. And those bones could be driven into the, the fragments could get into the brain. You could have, again, as we mentioned, that basilar skull fracture that shows with bleeding in the eyes, raccoon eyes under the eyes, to the nose, the ears. Those are really good indicators that you're dealing with skull fracture. Um, or open skull fracture, where indeed you break through the skin and there's portions of the skull or brain coming out, extending out of the head. If you have something like that, the mortality rate is pretty high. Um, expect that patient to not do very well if live at all beyond the scene. Usually, if you show up and there's brain matter on the ground and they still have a heartbeat, you got there very quickly. Um, it only takes a few minutes for the brain and everything to shut down. And so if it's laying out, if things have burst out of the brain or been blown out, they don't have a chance of survival. We don't, we don't save those patients. Okay, so let's get into traumatic brain injuries. And so we're looking at kind of the two main ways that brain injuries can occur, even without skull fracture. You can get this by the, the whiplash or the smashing of the brain into the inside of the frontal skull and against the back of the occipital skull. Those ways, as the brain connects, let's say as we fall and we hit our head on the ground, the brain smashes directly into the inside of that skull. That's what we would call a primary injury. It's the direct collision of brain into the inside of the cranium. There's then the secondary, which is the reverse back whiplash or the contra coup, the smashing backwards of the brain in recoil, smashing the back of the head. So we call this COUP coup slash contra coup, C-O-N-T-R-A-C-O-U-P. Coup, direct smash, contra coup, secondary smash. Primary, secondary. So you're seeing here a primary, secondary, primary, secondary. You see that in the, in the GIF there? Primary, secondary, primary, secondary. Primary, secondary, primary, secondary. What happens with this? Well, you can cause those tissues to start to swell, for blood vessels to burst and start bleeding in there. You're going to start starving the brain. So you get hypoxia. You get initially hypotension. And then as the pressure begins to build in there, you get hypertension, increased intracranial pressure, and you start to see some wild things occur. Rather than the blood pressure bottoming out and the heart rate speeding up until that patient just bleh, dies, which is how we normally see shock patients, what you get in this case is the blood pressure begins to climb, climbing higher and higher and higher. And the heart rate to deal with that slows down goes slower and slower and slower. And meanwhile, the breathing gets all over the place. So you see this irregular breathing, slow heart rate, skyrocketing blood pressure. That is a really good sign that you have some kind of massive intracranial pressure. And of course you can get infection from those things. So we're gonna keep moving through this. We're gonna look at some of this um, injury and why you get intracranial pressure. Well, what's bleeding in there? Remember the brain is largely a closed cavity. There's one hole to get everything out. So as the bleeding begins to increase in there, it's smashing the brain, displacing it, taking up the space of the cerebral spinal fluid and causing all around vascular tension to the tissue. You can see here in the lower left image of a plasma liquid filling into that space. That might be an infection or it might be a burst of the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, working down the way there, you're looking at brain structure and swelling. And by the way, you can see the difference between CT scans and MRIs. So the CT is a very quick 
Do they have a major issue or do they not? It takes about 10 seconds to get a CT scan. And they're looking on these patients of like where the injury is, what do we have in store for us today? Then they're going to, if they have time to run a series of MRI scans to see exactly at what level is that clot or that bleed, where does it start and where does it end? And by the using the magnetic resonance, they can find it in a three-dimensional plane, locate where it is, develop a game plan for surgery, and then get to work. And that can happen in, oh, you know, two hours maybe. Okay, so what I mentioned earlier with a high blood pressure, slow pulse, and irregular breathing is what we would call Cushing's triad. It's the exact opposite of hypovolemic shock. In hypovolemic shock, your blood pressure decreases, bottoms out, while your heart rate speeds up and you're breathing oh, you're tired. You know, you, you can breathe in different ways with hypovolemic shock. But the big difference is look how it's completely opposite of hypovolemic shock. Rather than your heart racing away, trying to move that blood through, the heart slows down and it begins to slowly methodically pump big glug ejections of blood up into the skull to defeat the increasing pressure that's occurring in the skull. And so the blood pressure begins to go up, your heart slows down to push a huge amount of fluid up into the brain so that it can make it so that whatever's pressing down doesn't overpower it. And in that act sends more blood up into the brain to start swelling even more and more, which then causes your heart to slow down more to beat stronger, to get blood to that area, for the blood pressure to go up, for that to make your heart need to slow down even more, to fill up with more fluid, to pump the blood up. And that only happens because, don't worry about this too much EMR students, but there's something called Starling's reflex. And it's the idea that if I'm, if I'm gonna flex my muscle here, right? I'm getting a certain amount, like what's the distance? Let's imagine there's a sack of water in here and I'm moving water through like that, right? That's about, I'm moving a little bit every time I squeeze it and that, that water's squirting out. Well, in the Starling's reflex says, if I were to allow that muscle to flex all the way out, feel that, that ventricle all the way open, and that only works if you slow down your heart rate to the point where it can completely fill. So I open up the blood all that way and put that little water balloon in there. Now, as I squeeze, <laughs> I'm pumping huge volumes of blood out. So by allowing your heart to swell and fill with more fluid, now it can contract and push more blood volume with each contraction. And by doing that, the additional amount of blood is a really enough to kind of glug and like force blood through the system and force blood up into the brain to defeat gravity and the increasing intracranial pressure. Okay, don't sweat it if you don't quite get it. Hopefully I gave you an information about that. Shane Stokes or biot breathing or ataxic breathing refers to the fact that this center that controls your breathing, the, the, the midbrain, is under pressure. It's not able to read the cerebral spinal fluid clearly enough. And so by the time that it's measuring the CO2, um, the CO2 is typically at a high level and it causes your body to hyperventilate. And then when it analyzes it again, the CO2 is at a very low level and you stop breathing or you slow down to a point of a apnea where you're not breathing whatsoever. So you have this irregular breathing that's not like a wave, like every few seconds coming through. It's like... <laughs> It's like you're getting it all done in one, one hyperventilation session, and then it goes away. Um, so we're seeing a widening pulse pressure. Again, EMRs don't sweat it. Widening pulse pressure. Blood pressure is going up. The difference between the high and low number of blood pressure is getting larger. That's pulse pressure. Blood pressure is getting to 140, 150, 180, 200, 220. I've seen it at 240, over 120. That's pretty incredible when you consider you wanted it somewhere around 120 
for the, the high number, not 240. Um, okay, so we're seeing that occurring, that triad, that Cushing's triad of high blood pressure, bradycardia, irregular breathing. Oftentimes that's coming with other signs of head trauma, irregular pupils, decreased level of consciousness, nausea, projectile vomiting, um, and then posturing, which people kind of go into a fetal position when they're dying, when they're in great amounts of pain or they're getting close to death. They see the bodies have gone into the initial stage of development, that, that, that feeling. There's another one where everything flexes out called the cerebrate um, or extension. And we'll get into that more with trauma because that's usually um, we're dealing with patients going into comas and things. So we'll talk about that later. That is what a, a biot or um, Shane Stokes breathing would look like if we were going to map it out on a waveform. So down below here, you see biots like ah, 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 stop, no breathing. Then ah, 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 stop. Shane Stokes would be slow to fast to slow. <laughs> I saw it one time. I'm not, you don't always see this with all your trauma patients, but if you do see it, it's a great indicator that you have increased intracranial pressure. Here are some other pictures of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, kind of hard to see if you can't really notice it, but the, the white in there is the blood filling in these different spaces. The irregular colors are probably either tumors or clots. That's an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. That's blood filling in there. Okay, epidurals versus subdural hematomas. This is another big portion. So if you need to take a break, go take that break. I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay, epidurals refers to the fact that the bleeding is occurring outside or in between that first dura mater and the arachnoid layer, somewhere in the outer level of the dura. As it bleeds in there, there are a lot of little arteries that run through so that when you smack the arteries, they can rupture and they bleed very, very quickly. This is usually from blunt force trauma directly to the side there um, and it breaking those topical blood vessels, those topical arteries, not the ones in the scalp. Underneath the, the cranium, in the skull, in there as the head smashes against the inside of the cranium, the, the blood vessels that run in just inside the dura there rupture. Their arteries bleed. It happens very quickly. What we usually see happening is a rapid accumulation of blood between the skull and the dura mater. And these patients typically have concussions. They get knocked out for a few seconds to minutes. They wake up and they're in a period of complete normality, a period of what they call lucidity, which is a, um, I'm, I'm with it. I just got my bell rung. Good God, what the hell happened? I just know my head hurts. You know, it's, it's painful. It's just throbbing. It'll be okay. Um, they're ANO4. They talk to you. They sometimes say, I don't think I need to go to the hospital. You analyze them. You don't see blood or cerebral spinal fluid coming out. There's no fracture of the basilar skull. ANO4, pupils, pearl, both constricting and reacting appropriately to light. And you decide, okay, they can go home. And they go home. And this bleed is fast accumulating and at some point it fills up to a drastic level increase in cranial pressure occurs they have a seizure they get knocked out and then everything just fills and swells and that patient dies within hours so there have been a couple of movie stars or, or or celebrities that died of this all kind of at the same time a couple of years back it was what billy mays was the um infomercial guy i think a, a suitcase hit his head. Why do I keep hitting my head? I better take it easy. Uh, smashed the top of his head and he, as on a plane when he was getting out and went, I'm okay. Went home, died. And Liam Neeson's wife was, was skiing. She fell and kind of thwacked her head on the, on a, I guess, rock or snow or some kind of concussive mechanism caused her to kind of get dazed. And then that night died from it, found unresponsive. By the time they get to it, it's too late. So that's 
again, it's a rapid, an epidural is a rapid bleed. Oftentimes it's a, an artery, it's an arterial bleeding because that's why it's so rapid. It's, it's got high pressure and it's filling that space very, very quickly. It's nearly always the result of some kind of linear fracture to the head. And there's a moment of that lucidity of A and O4. They're fine. Sometimes they argue with you to go home. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And they go home and they die at home rather than going to the hospital. Dwayne Allman was another guitar player for the Allman Brothers. Crashed his motorcycle, got up. I'm good, I'm good. I'm just bummed. I busted my bike up. Went home, found him dead the next couple, like two days later. So um, you have to watch out for that period of lucidity and don't let them talk you into saying, all right, you can go home, you're okay. The opposite is the, is the subdural bleed, which is now below the dura. This usually is, a, 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 it's a venous or a vein that's bleeding. It's still outside the brain itself. It's just within the dura there. Um, and this is potentially from like, slow deceleration or, or I should say strong deceleration. So like falling and hitting your head on the ground, um, falling backwards and smashing the back of your head against the ground. That kind of rocking of the brain is oftentimes what does it. And it is, aside from it being venous, vein in nature, the, the, the big issues people that get this or people that have this occur is usually they're elderly so their blood vessels are not as elastic as they used to be. They're a lot more fragile. Um, alcoholics, same idea. The elasticity is lost in the blood vessels, so they can tear a lot more easily. Or elderly alcoholics. Um, diabetics is another one where the, the elasticity is kind of etched away by the use of additional sugar in the bloodstream. And as a, just a normal trip and fall will cause these people to fall and rupture, a small bleed. Patient gets up, I'm fine. This bleed begins. Patients on blood thinners, another big situation where you're not going to catch this. And this bleed just trickles and trickles for days, sometimes even a week or longer. And so you think nothing of it. And then you arrive on the scene to see this patient thinking, oh, she's altered. And then as you start looking into it, you notice stroke-like symptoms, then you have to find out and maybe this gets misdiagnosed as a hemorrhagic stroke when in fact what it is, one of these subdurals has occurred several days or even a week before. It was a small slip and fall. Person got up, they were fine. They went about their day. They have no, ha had no other injuries, no other signs and symptoms that anything is wrong. And then suddenly as this slowly begins to fill up over the course of several days, now the signs and symptoms have increased to the point where they're altered. They're asking repetitive questions. They might show deficit to one side of the body or the other. Family member goes, I don't know. I didn't hear any, you know, no, she was fine. She didn't fall today. And then as you're walking out, they go, you know, I, just so you know, the patient did fall like four days ago though. And they went into the hospital and they just released her. They said she was fine. They didn't, I mean, did they do a CT scan? Uh, I don't know. I don't think, I don't know. I don't think so. So, okay. So probably when it had happened, even if they had done a CT scan, it's difficult to say if it would have been showing at that point. Um, this patient had these issues occur. The small bleed started over the course of days, not hours, but days. The bleeding got to a point where there was significant uh, irreversible damage to the body and you find them at death's doorstep when finally somebody else noticed that there's significant alteration to their level of consciousness and it's all those things that i mentioned as well um but you can have bleeds that occur inside the brain really not much different than what we've explained here again rapid deceleration it might mask itself as the subdural hematoma, it might come on a little bit faster and look like an epidural hematoma. This is kind of that rapid rocking back and forth of that, that coup contra coup. And then you can have like all of these different areas that blood's accumulating. The epidural between the skull and the dura or the inner and outer layer of that of the of the mod dura mater. You can have the subdural that's filling up the space within the layers of the dura. 
you can have the contusion that's causing the blood within the gray matter and the white matter to bleed out. The blood vessels have ruptured there. There's all sorts of just crazy ways that you, you can bleed out and die from it. So we have to be aware of all of those problems, including subarachnoids, where it's like into those fibery web-like layers, into the, the fine venous, the venules and arterioles that run through there. You uh, results in bloody CSF, signs of meningeal irritation. Oh, and by the way, there's no reason that it can't be all of these. With significant head trauma, you can tear arteries, veins, interior. You can bruise the gray matter. You can cut the exterior laceration. You know, major trauma to the head where you smash from jumping off a third-story building. It's not going to just choose one of these. It's going to be many of them. So we have to be aware of that anytime we're dealing with this. We're using our best judgment, but we don't have a CT scanner. We need to get them to the hospital so that they can analyze this with the equipment and can get to work, which means package them up. Don't waste a lot of time on scene. Get a good head to toe, get them straightened up and get out of there. Code three. The one that is the least damaging is a concussion. And that's really just a jostling or a shaking of the brain to a point where it's like dropping a hard drive on the ground. It kind of shuts everything off and the brain fries, frizzles, and then takes a few minutes to reboot coming back on. As impermanent as concussions are, they're noticing people that have experienced as many as two or more have definite mental and cognitive uh, deficit later in life. So you do not want to be engaged in any activities that continually concuss you, smash or bang your head. And that includes boxing. That includes MMA, that includes football. That includes head banging, literally, you know, just being a jackass or rugby player or just doing this at a concert, you know, your whole life. It does do some damage. So, and they've noticed as they go in and um, a lot of professional athletes are donating their brains to the study of concussion, to the study of traumatic brain injury. And they're seeing that these brains of the 50 year olds that have either committed suicide or died prematurely of Parkinson's uh, have the brain matter um, that looks more like a, an 80 or 70 year old uh, human being because it's just been degenerated from continual trauma over and over again. So ask about things like, if you don't see bleeding and bruising, what about dizziness, weakness, visual, double vision, um, uh, pain, delight, nausea, vomiting, ringing in ears, slurred speech, inability to focus, all of those things indicate a pretty decent um, head injury. You could also have contusions, you know, bleeding or bruising that's filling up in that space much more serious than a concussion and involves physical injury to brain tissue. It could sustain long lasting, even permanent damage. And the patient may exhibit any of the signs of brain injury. And as I mentioned with amygdala, with the amygdala and the amygdala injuries, you might have a patient who's acting just completely irrational emotionally. You may have a patient that is scared to death every time they see your face. Um, weird things happen. Probably, if you're seeing these outrageous emotional shifts, there may be an issue at the amygdala level. So keep that in mind. That's a very difficult place to operate. And the sooner they can get that patient in for analysis, the better. Okay. And again, of course, there's always things like head in, uh, um, um, strokes and so forth to figure this out. Do that mimic the same traumatic injury. So when, when in doubt, consider it traumatic um, and get them into the hospital and see if there's anything that looks like it's hemorrhagic or if it's ischemic. We'll go from there. All right, we're going to get into neck injuries. This is what we call compression or axial loading. When the head smashes into the ground and compounds and compresses the whole vertebrae and all of the different discs in between the vertebrae, are smashed together. This is what we call axial loading, and it's from head first falls into the ground. Another way that can happen, whoops, another way that happens oftentimes is diving injuries into water, shallow water. People dive in and they smash their head in only a few feet of water where they think it's about 10 feet deep. 
um, a lot of times that causes instant paralysis, potentially drowning, which means that when we go and manage people in water injuries, we by just by default, imagine they have spinal trauma as well. The opposite of that is distracting injury or hyperextension, where the spine is pulled apart to such a force that you snap the rubbery cord, boom, like that. So you're as you're separating out, kabang, and that, that, that rope snaps um, and completely detaches the spinal cord. If you have any of those problems, all of these calls, get the whole shebang. Collar, backboard, straps, headbed, position of comfort, high or that positioning, um, packed into the ambulance, supine, high flow oxygen if needed, and you're assessing every five minutes, get them to the hospital as quickly as you can. Uh, we're looking for Cushing's triad, which is the high blood pressure, slow pulse, irregular respirations. Those are almost dead giveaways that we have head trauma. If you don't see it, it doesn't mean that there's not head trauma. It just means that maybe they're just not showing it as well. So always rely on the, your worst case scenario and go from there. Oxygenate your patient to somewhere between 94 and 99%. You want them around that spot to get the benefit of oxygen without the detriment. And the detriment of oxygen in some cases is um, vasoconstriction. The, the, the blood vessels, when they're too oxygenated, when there's too much of the alkaline oxygen in it, will cause the vessels to vasoconstrict and pull away from the tissues. And you don't wanna do that. If your tissues are going to the damaged part of the brain, you want the blood to get there. If there's too much blood, if, um, oxygenated blood, and it starts to constrict all those blood vessels, you start to starve the distal parts of the body of that blood. Here is a way that you can open the airway if there's a neck injury. This is called a modified jaw thrust. So you put your thumbs on the cheeks, you put your index fingers in the angle of the jaw and it will pull the jaw out. Um, this works better in unconscious patients versus the airway mannequins, but you can still get a kind of a, a feel for the scissor technique that it takes on the airway mannequin. Really, what you're hoping is in a case where a patient has significant neck trauma and you need to open the airway, that they also have no gag reflex and you can put an OPA in and manage the airway that way. And we are using our backboards. If it's a patient that won't tolerate laying down, we might use a KED board to manage that patient. And that is it. Ladies and gentlemen, we got through it pretty quickly. Now, watch this, ask questions in class. Let me know if you have any questions and I will see you at the movies. Thank you so much and take care.